stay with me this morning. God has really been dealing with my heart about our church. He's really been dealing with me about our need for personal revival. And I hope and I pray that all of you are taking the challenge that we issued seriously and that every day of the week throughout the month of March, you're praying for God to show up in your life every single day for Jesus to make himself real. Because when Jesus becomes real to us personally, he will become real corporately. Amen? It has to take place in our heart and in our life first. Now, sometimes I come to the pulpit with a pellet gun message. A pellet gun message will kind of nick you, but it doesn't cut you. Sometimes we come to the platform and we have a shotgun message. And we shoot the shotgun message and it kind of spreads out there and covers everything generally. But today I'm coming to the platform with a rifle message. A rifle message is targeted. It's direct. And it's deadly. And it's powerful. And I need you to stay with me because this is one of those messages that God continued to grow and grow and grow this message as he was dealing with my heart. Using the same passage of scripture we've used this month, Psalm chapter 85 and verse 6. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Not only does our church need revival to be brought back to life, But Christianity needs a revival. Our country needs a revival. Our leaders need a revival. We're in need of Jesus Christ to show up in our life. Will you not revive us again? According to God's word, revival is applicable to each one of us. It's tangible, it's scriptural, and it's essential to our life. The evangelist Billy Sunday was asked by a lady one time, why do you continue to have these revivals over and over and over again? And Billy Sunday looked at her and said, why do you continue to take baths? Amen? We need to be revived. We need the cleansing of God's word. We need him to touch us and change us in a tangible way. We talked about the Asbury Revival and what a blessing that it was to see God bring over 70,000 people into a little town of 6,000 and how it literally touched our nation. We need to remember this morning, it's not about having a revival. It's about being a revival. Revival is not something we schedule, it's something we seek. It's not something that we plan, it's something we have to purpose in our heart. It's not something we promote, it has to be something that we personally participate in. A spontaneous overflow, the fruit of the Spirit, the favor of the Savior, the frustration of sinners, the faith of the saints. I think about Jonah when I think about revival. Nineveh needed a revival. In Jonah chapter 1, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And later on in verse 2, it says, arise and go to Nineveh. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh needed a revival. But listen to me, according to God's word, revival had to start in Jonah before it could ever make way to Nineveh. You can't give away what you don't possess, amen? We can't share what we don't have. And saving Nineveh, listen, saving Nineveh was no problem for God. But saving Jonah was a fishing expedition. Amen? He had to first get Jonah's attention, and then he could move on to Nineveh. In the belly of the whale, Jonah received a miraculous revival. I know he did because I love the passage of Scripture in Jonah chapter 2. Listen to verses 1 through 10. This is after God had dealt with Jonah. And I love, here's what revival looks like. I called out to the Lord out of my distress. 
And he answered me, saying, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me, and your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land, whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought my life up from the pit. O oh Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I vowed I will pay, salvation belongs to the Lord. And in verse 10 it says... Then the Lord spoke to the fish. I love that. Then the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. Revival came to Nineveh. But revival couldn't make it to Nineveh until it came to Jonah. Personal revival always begins with each one of us individually. And personal revival is dependent upon personal prayer. When revival comes, our circumstances will fade away. Our course will be reaffirmed. Our cause will be reestablished. Our commitment will be restored. And it's not a result of problems and priorities and personalities and positions and even preachers. God's word says revival is present in the midst of persecution, in the middle of problems. In the mystique of different personalities, Psalm 138 says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. I want us to realize this morning, Christianity doesn't need more services. We don't need more programs. We don't need more social events or celebrations. God's people need an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, soul-saving, sin-erasing, Jesus-chasing, banner-waving, Christ-honoring, Holy Spirit-moving revival. We need it in our midst. We need to come back from the dead. We need to be revived, renewed, and reestablished. And the first reaction that many have when God begins to move, just as they begin to move at Asbury, it's a negative reaction. Sadly, not all the reaction to God's movement is edifying and glorifying and gratifying. I read online some people that were posting comments about the Asbury revival. Here's what some of them wrote. I wonder what version of the Bible they're using. I wonder what kind of music they're playing. I wonder what denomination they are. I wonder what their motives are. God help us. Why do Christians major on minors? I remember John in the book of Mark when he had observed a man that had been delivered from a demon and in Mark chapter 9, John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone who was casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Do we understand what that scripture is saying? He didn't look like us, he didn't talk like us, he didn't act like us, he didn't sing like us, he didn't come together when we came together, he didn't come to our meetings, he wasn't in Sunday school, he didn't dress the way we thought he ought to dress, he might have had a tattoo, he might have had a ring in his ear, on and on and on and on, all the things that don't matter to God that have no bearing whatsoever on the life of a believer and a heart that's saved by Christ Jesus. And that's really what John was saying to Jesus. And look at what Jesus' response was to him. Jesus said in verse 39, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name 
will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, for the one who's not against us is for us. Amen? We need to get our eyes off people. We need to get our eyes off circumstances and events, and we need to firmly fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. If we want revival in our life, if we want revival in our church, it's going to come through Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, please stay with me this morning. I've already warned you, this message grew and grew and grew. And I went through a process, and I mentioned to some of the, the staff this week, when God's dealing with a pastor's heart and you're preparing a message, and you know that message is growing, the first thought that we have is, boy, i got to cut this. i got to whack this. i got to cut it down. But listen, loved one, if God gave that to us, do we want to cut it? No. No. And the more I prayed about it, the more I thought about it, the more I was even more convinced that God wants these words spoken to us. So this morning, stay with me. I'll do my best to move quickly. First of all, let's pay attention to the act of revival. What exactly is revival. I want you to know this morning, first of all, revival brings a renewing. It's a renewal of our mind, it's a renewal of our spirit, and it renews in us the knowledge of the nature of sin and the nurture of the Savior. We need a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's awfully renewing, but it's also refreshing. We all need to fall back in love with Jesus. I was thinking about in preparation when I met Mary Ann, the love of my life. And if some of you will think back to that special time in your life when you met that special somebody, you couldn't get enough of them. Look at George and Nancy down here laughing. They're me, 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 all the butterflies. We're all flying around. Isn't it pretty? We couldn't get enough of each other, could we? We, I mean, if, if we were burning up the telephone. We're coming to see each other. We're, we're trying to plan everything we could do together. So that's the way we ought to be about Jesus. And when we're not that way about Jesus, we need to be revived again. We're dead. We need to be brought back to life. Listen, loved ones, Christians ought to be clamoring to get to God's house. There ought to be nothing that can keep us here, and we ought to come here with a full expectation, knowing that God is going to do something incredible, not only in our life, but in the life of others. I think of the lesson of the prodigal son. A revival is also a returning. And the prodigal son had gone away into the lost land, but he came to himself. I love the scripture in Luke chapter 15. It says he came to himself, and he returned again. Revival helps us recognize the Father, and it helps us return to the Father. Revival is a renewal, it's a returning, but it's also revealing, and it reveals the excitement and the expectancy and the expression of Almighty God. We need a refreshing, but we also need a restoring. To be restored means to be reestablished. In Psalms chapter 51, restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. If you're following in your Bible, underline two words in that passage of Scripture. Joy and willing. Revival captures the joy of salvation, but it also captures the will of service. We all need that will of service in our life. We all need the joy of our salvation on a daily basis to understand and believe and remember what God is continually doing for us. It's a renewing, it's a returning, it's a revealing, it's refreshing, it's restoring, and it's regenerating. And we're regenerated by repentance. Now I've got to park here for just a minute. Repentance is not an apology. 
Repentance doesn't mean, oh, I'm sorry for what I've done. That's, that's an apology. A repentance is an action. It means I don't do that anymore, and I do do this. Amen? It means that when I've done you wrong, I have taken action to correct my wrong. It's not an apology. Repentance needs to come to the church. Repentance needs to come to the people of God. And where there's repentance, there will always be regeneration and renewal. Psalms 51 verse 7 says, Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin. Blot out my iniquities. And notice in that passage of scripture, the actions of regeneration and repentance are a purging, a washing, a replacing, a reset, and a severing from my sins. We've looked at the act of revival, but now let's look at the assessment of the revival. Why? Why do we need revival? Number one, we need revival because we become indifferent. Indifferent. We're just going through the motions. We're just doing what we're doing because that's the way we've always done it. We're just coming to church because I'm supposed to do that on Sunday. We're just taking part because we feel like somehow somebody is looking at us and expecting that of us, and we become indifferent. A couple of weeks ago in the message, I talked about the Chinese water torture, that constant drip, 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 drip. Our lives get that way. We get indifferent. I, I was telling my wife this week on the phone, she had asked me one morning, how's your morning going? I said, you know what, honey? I said, I'm so weary of the same thing over and over and over. You know what? I get up in the morning, I brush my teeth, I shower, I do these things, I get ready, I go to work, I come home, I rinse and repeat, and it all starts again the same day. The next day, everything goes in, it's one after the other, and it's way ahead. And, and, and we're lost. We're lost in living. And we become indifferent. We're indifferent to life and to the Lord and to his leadership. And Jesus Christ can't stand indifference. I know it's true because in Revelation he said, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. And I would that you would either be cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I want no part of you. Jesus is not a God of indifference. He has never been indifferent. He's not indifferent about the problems in your life. He's not indifferent about his will to save your life and give you eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's important to the Savior. It's not something that's an indifference. We need revival in our midst because of indifference. But we also need revival because of immaturity. There are Christians that are still drinking milk. They should be eating meat, but they're drinking milk. Hebrews chapter 5 says, though this time you ought to be, I love this, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Why? Because we're immature in Christ Jesus. We're babies. We're not brutes. We become impoverished and impetuous and immature. We need revival. We need revival because of indifference. We need revival because of immaturity. And we need revival because of indulgence. And the world is filling the voids of our life that we're leaving open. Putting it simply, we're eating junk food. Every day of the week, we're ingesting junk food. The junk food of political correctness, universal theology, transgenderism, homosexuality, racism, prosperity thinking, fear-mongering, pandemics, epidemics, and even academics. We're, we're, we're dining at a world buffet 
And it's starving our soul. It's starving our heart. It's giving us no nutrients. We can't grow. We need revival. We also need revival because of indecision. Where indecision thrives, there's always a lack of conviction. I need a conviction of sin. I need to be convicted of selfishness and separation and isolation and dedication. And nothing changes until something changes. I need revival because of indifference and immaturity and indulgence and indecision. But here, listen to this. I need revival because of indigestion. Think about that. Indigestion. I'm always taking things in, but it's never flowing out. Loved ones, think about your body. When you continually put things in and nothing goes out, that's a problem. That's indigestion. I'll, I wish I could sing the Pepto-Bismol song. Can't sing heartburn in your digest. I, I don't know. I can't sing that song. You know the song. But we have spiritual indigestion. I think about the Dead Sea, 233 square miles of water, 27.34 cubic miles of depth. It's the fourth saltiest body of water in the world. And it can't support life. Why? Why can't it support life? It has indigestion. You see, the Dead Sea has no outflow. It has no tributaries that lead out of it. It only has the Jordan River feeding into it. And where there's no outflow, we will die. And listen to me, church. Where there's no outflow in this church, this church will die. And so will every church die when there's no outflow of God's love, when there's no outflow of God's grace, when we don't take his word and carry it to our community, when we don't care enough about others to, to grasp God and lift up the standard of Jesus Christ and let them know they're loved. And there's someone that needs them when there's all inflow and no outflow, we need revival. So we've looked at the act of revival. We've looked at the, the assessment of revival. But now let's look at the application of revival. When, exactly when, is the right time to have a revival? Well, I suggest to you that first of all, when there's a lack of concern, we need a revival. You know, our burdens get heavy. Our obligations get repetitious. And in the course of life, our compassion for others fades away. We become dry-eyed Christians in a sin-soaked world. We need revival when there's a lack of concern, but we also need revival when there's a lack of control. Remember this. If my life is not in God's control... I'm out of control. Let me say that again. If my life is not in God's control, I am out of control. And when there's a lack of control, we need a revival. I don't know how you are in your life, but I can tell you this positively for certain in mine. Absolutely, the last thing I need in my life is more self-control. The last thing I need is more of John's control in anything I do. Because I've already shown and I've already proven the results of that. It's not a pretty picture, y'all. Not a pretty picture. I don't need self-control of my attitude and my abilities, my friends, my family, my finances, my thoughts, my treasures, my temptations, my home, my habits, or my hope. I need less self-control, and I need more Savior control. 
I need to be controlled by Jesus Christ. I need to be controlled by his Holy Spirit. I need him working in me. I need him working through me. And Proverbs chapter 14 says, There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. I don't need self-control. I need his control. And revival reminds us. We need revival when there's a lack of concern, when there's a lack of control, but also when there's a lack of commitment. Consider this statement. Motivation gets you going, but commitment keeps you going. Amen? We need a fresh commitment to the Word of God. We need a fresh commitment to the work of God, the worship of God, the will of God, the way of God. And in Proverbs chapter 3, it says, In all of thy ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. We need revival when there's a lack of concern, a lack of control, a lack of commitment, and a lack of cause, a higher purpose. There's more to Jesus Christ. There's more to his service than fame or fortune, struggling and surviving and working and withering. The very first message I ever preached in my life, and this was in the 80s in Lubbock, Texas, the name of the message was, Is There Not a Cause? And I took the passage about David and Goliath, where David had come on the scene, and all the armies of God were withering away from in front of Goliath, and David came on the scene and said, What are you doing? Is there not a cause? And listen to me, loved ones. When we don't have a cause, we need a revival. Amen? We're dead. We need something to happen in our life. We need God to show up. We need to see him personally. We need to see him individually. And when we see him personally, and when we see him individually, we'll all see him collectively. We need a revival to remind us that we have a lack of concern and a lack of control and a lack of commitment and a lack of call. Well, we've looked at the act of revival, we've looked at the assessment of revival, we've looked at the application of revival. Now let's look at the effect of revival. Exactly what will revival do for us? Why is it important that we have revival? First of all, I suggest to you that if we have revival, it'll make the person of Jesus Christ real. Boy, I need the person of Jesus Christ real. I need him to be real in my my life, in my thoughts. I need him to be real in my finances. I need him to be real in my relationship and in my marriage, in my home life, in my work life, in my communal life. I need Jesus to be real, and revival makes Jesus real. We remember his life and his love and his lordship and his leadership. And when we see the person of Jesus, we will experience the promises of Jesus. I need to make the person of Jesus real, but I need to make the premise of Jesus a reality. A premise is a previously accepted fact. In the life of Jesus... There was a basic premise on which everything was built. And that same premise applies to you and it applies to me today. The premise of Jesus was the promise of Jesus in God's word. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything that was made. We need revival because we need the person of Jesus to become real, the premise of Jesus to be a reality in our life. And then thirdly, we need our prayer life to be refreshing. Refreshing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, Rejoice always, 
Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I need my prayer life to be refreshing, but I need my praise life to be responsive. Psalms chapter 16. In your presence, in your presence, you get that? In your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand, there's pleasures evermore. I need to be in his presence. Amen? And I get into his presence when I'm individually in my personal life, responsive in my praise life, lifting up praises to him every day. And I don't care how bad it is, and I don't care how bad we're hurt, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances or situations are, I should praise him continually. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. We praise our way through problems. We praise our way through circumstances. We praise our way through situations. I need revival when my praise life is no longer responsive. Amen? I like what Jackie wanted to say this morning because our praise is... It's not just something we do. It's not just songs we come up here to sing. We, if we're doing that, we're missing everything. It's our hearts to his heart, extolling his goodness, extolling his greatness, extolling his mercy and his grace. I need my prayer life to be refreshing, and I need my praise life to be responsive. But also... A revival will make our presence to God rewarding. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. Let me ask you this morning, are you enriched in every way to be generous in every way? Did you know that God's people Christians. The Bible says they will know we are Christians by our love. And you see, you've been here long enough to hear me enough to know love is an action verb. It's impossible to love without doing. It's impossible. It's impossible to love without giving. God's people should be givers. We ought to be looking every day of the week for an opportunity to give. Amen? We're not supposed to just come into the church. Listen, the church has done a great disservice hawking for money, building empires out of church buildings that are monuments to themselves taking money that's supposed to be used for the service of God and pouring it into adulation of men. We've done a horrible disservice. But your giving should not just happen at this church. Your giving ought to happen every day of the week. It ought to happen at work. It ought to happen at home. When you see a need, you ought to be looking for an opportunity to fill it. When you see somebody hurting, you ought to look for an opportunity to lift that burden. When you see an opportunity, you should seize it. And listen to me, when God's people are revived again, when God's people are givers, when God's people are looking to meet needs, God shows up. He changes our life. He changes our situations. He changes our church. God will do a mighty move, but we need to be givers. Because you see, Jesus Christ did not come to take. He came to give. He gave, God gave his only begotten son. The most precious thing to him. Revival will happen in us. Revival will happen in our life when we start to give. And I'm not talking about you giving here. I want you giving out there. That's where they need Jesus. Look, saints, we come in here, we need Jesus. But it doesn't just stop in here. 
It's not about starting in here and having a nice, cozy, little, warm church service and leaving in the rest of the week living like a hellion. That's not what it's all about. No. We're supposed to leave these doors, go out into the streets, and touch lives and change them. And how do we do that? We do that with our love. And we do that because we love, we give. Amen? Along with God, show me your presence. Along with God, I want a personal experience with you. Along with God, please show up with me personally. We should be prayed. God, lay burdens on my heart. Give me opportunities to give. Give me opportunities to bless someone. Our blessing box is already probably already, at least in the time that I've been at this church, it's given our church more visibility than anything else I've seen. We have people showing up. We, <coughs> we looked at a security video. We had a, a man show up at 4.15 in the morning. And he was nice and dressed up and all set, but he went to the blessing box to get him something to eat. Obviously, probably on his way to work. Do we realize that what we're giving is touching? What we're giving is making a difference. What we're giving is letting people know, Jesus loves me. Jesus cares about me. And it's not all about some sacred spiritual platitudes. It's because we get into action. It'll make our presence to God rewarding. We need the person of Jesus the premise of Jesus. We need our prayer life refreshing. We need our praise life responsive. We need our presence to be rewarding. And listen, here's the real important one. We need to make people relevant. Jesus came for people. He didn't come for the church and the steeple. He didn't come for some of our programs or for socials. He came for people. Jesus said in John chapter 13, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. I love a song that's written by Steve Green. And I, I listen to this song all the time. The words to the song say, every day they pass me by, I can see it in their eye. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries, but only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. People need the Lord. When will we realize people need the Lord? God, give us a love for people. God, make people relevant in our life. God, and listen to me. So many times we don't get involved because we think, well, I don't know enough, and I don't have enough Bible knowledge, and I don't have this, and I don't have that. Listen to me. Where did we even start talking about that? It's not important. Jesus said, if you just love them, that's it. Love them. And they'll wonder why in the heck you love them. Why you care. And sooner or later, they're either going to ask or they're going to check it out themselves and find out that the reason you loved them is because Jesus loves us. Amen? He loved us and set us free. He picked us up. He cleaned us up. We're not asking you to go out and thump the Bible at someone. I'm challenging you to go love someone. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus changed our life with. He changed us with his love. We'll revolutionize the world. We'll have revival in our life. We'll have revival in our church when we love people. 
when we reach out for people, when we look for needs to meet, when we look for burdens to carry. Revival. We need revival. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. It'll change our life. Revival is the return of the people of God to the word of God, in the house of God, by the power of God, according to the plan of God, under the direction of God that receives the blessings of God. We need a revival. And God's recipe for revival is found right here in God's recipe book. The recipe book of life. Here's the recipe for revival. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. In the book of James chapter 4, draw nigh unto God. And he will draw nigh unto us. Revive us again. Let's stand together.